One of the first tactics mentioned when the executive order first came out was the need to have a blueprint for everything that makes up your software application. This blueprint is called a Software Bill of Materials, often shortened to SBOM. It shows all of the third-party code and dependencies that together make up the application. GitLab provides a dependency list, which is much the same thing, but the harder part is certifying it. One of GitLab's key channel partners, BoxBoat, has solved this challenge. Cole Kennedy from BoxBoat and Nicole Schwartz from GitLab will together explain more about the ins and outs of SBOMs and how they can help you secure the integrity of your software supply chain. Hello everyone, welcome to my talk, Securing the Software Supply Chain with SBOM and Attestation. Let me introduce you to myself. My name is Cole Kennedy. I'm a director of defense initiatives at Boxboat Technologies. Um, you know, I've been working a lot in supply chain security over the past couple of years. Uh, recently, I contributed to the CNCF Secure Supply Chain Best Practices paper. Highly recommend you give that a, give that a look. Um, I'm a member of the CNCF Security Tag and the Supply Chain Working Group. Uh, I have customers in defense, financing, and critical infrastructure. So I'm here today to talk to you about a problem, right? Uh, right now, software consumers have really no way to really understand the risk level of the software that's running on their systems. And this is because software producers have no real incentive well, until recently to produce a software bill of materials that gives those consumers of that software understanding of, of the risk level of that software. And this is a problem because zero trust architecture really requires a strong identity system. Um, and this identity system must really be based upon the immutable attributes of the workloads and the users running on the system. You know, in the recent executive order, they said they, the trust we place in our digital infrastructure should be proportional to how trustworthy and transparent the infrastructure is. So this is why they are requiring SBOM and uh, software producers must produce the SBOM along with their software artifacts. This gives the transparency software consumers need to understand the risk level of the software on their systems. So the solution, right, is that executive order, right? We, we have to have some sort of regulation because we, our federal, our, our IT systems and our federal government and our defense systems are at risk if we really don't understand what's in them. Right, so the NTIA and uh, and NIST recently uh, defined what critical software is, and the list is very extensive. Anything that deals with authentication, uh, access to network resources or network controllers, right? Disk access. I, I encourage you to go look at the the link um, that I have right here and actually look at all the different uh, requirements or all the different definitions of critical software. Um, and additionally, very recently, um, uh, the NTIA released what the minimum SBOM elements are, right? And it's important to, know, to look at that to make sure that your software is in compliance in uh, your, your generation of your SBOM. Um, so again, on the executive order, on section four, the timeline is very, very, very fast, right? Um, you know, the, especially for how uh, fast the government generally moves. Uh, by May 13th, 2022, uh, there is going to be a report due for pilot programs implementing everything that was in that executive order. Um, so that's within one year of that order coming out. Um, so you go back to the, the uh, CNCF paper that we contributed to at, at BoxBoat. Right, uh, you know, we really pushed for the idea of this out of band verification, understanding that each piece of the software supply chain is actually trustworthy. And once we put all those pieces together, right, we're able to attest that the artifact that came out is also trustworthy, right? But, but we need to explicitly define those trust relationships. And I'm going to show you a little bit about what that looks like in the demo that we have going. Um, but really to understand this demo and why it's so important, I want to step back and explain, you know, zero trust architecture and how to decompose that 
in a way that really makes sense, right? Zero trust architecture is not a product that you can buy. It's a design decision that, that you do, that you place upon your networks. Um, at the core of zero trust architecture, I feel is identity. Now identity is the, um, uh, is the immutable attributes of either your workloads or your users. And those should be cryptographically, uh, um, I, I, they should be uh, identified in either cryptographic tokens, uh, such as JWTs or X509 certificates. So everything in your system can be cryptographically verified. Um, the next is policy. Um, generally, when we talk about policy, we talk about change control boards. Uh, and hey, we want to know if a change going into a system meets organizational policy. So we have a group of people that go together, review it, and see if that works out. But uh, with zero trust architecture, we, we, we change how that works. And we actually encode those policies in pieces of code or documents that, that, we, can, that we can use uh, to make decisions in real time. Um, and, and last is control. And control will take these identity documents from either workloads or users, along with those organizational policy documents, and, and put those together to make a decision when a user or a resource on the network uh, requests access to, a, uh, to, to compute or network resources. And, and when you have all these working together, um, you really do have zero trust architecture. You don't need Kubernetes, you don't need Docker, you don't need any of that. But what you do need is a foundation of identity, policy, and control. So what happens when we apply these, these concepts to a build system? Uh, well, traditionally, right, we have our, our build steps and they're a chain of steps and each one relies on the other, right? And if those break down, right, or if there's a compromise somewhere in there, we may never know. Um, and, and the key to understanding if, if there's a compromise within that build system is really looking at the metadata, the inputs and the outputs of uh, each one of those steps, analyzing them to see if, if uh, they're trustworthy and if uh, they're actually correct. Um, so without that actual metadata verification, what we're doing is actually placing trust in its producer of the software rather than the actual software artifact. And that's not good. We, we saw with some recent attacks from some big companies, right? You know, everyone's really vulnerable to this uh, if, if they place all their trust in their software producers because everyone's going to get hacked. But we need a way to verify that, hey, these build systems are, are secure, uh, and the artifacts that came out of it pass this test and, and the rigor that, that we expect it to. Um, so MITRE has actually been working on this a little bit in this concept of evidence-based trust. Uh, this is a graphic from a, a paper that was released earlier this year uh, called Deliver Uncompromised. Now, if you go look it up, there's, there's two of these papers, right? There's an older one and there's a newer one. I recommend that you look at the newer one. Um, because it really builds on this SBOM and this evidence, using the evidence to actually make decision execution time, right? So the concept here is that we bubble up all that metadata from the different stages of your CI pipeline. You sign that metadata, and then you can use that metadata downstream to actually make decisions when you when you when you uh, when that resource requests uh, access to network. Uh, resources in the form of certificates um, with an identity or it, it uh, requests access to compute resources, right, at admission control. Um, so let's decompose that, right? Each, each of those steps, uh, CI steps, has different inputs and outputs. And when we look at these inputs and outputs and we can build policy against them, we can have a lot more trust in the system. So different things that go into uh, a CI step, right? You get your runtime environment. It might be uh, what's your Docker image that you're using it. And then you have your source package, right? You have your, your internal code that you're compiling. And then you also have packages that you may be bringing in externally. Uh, you have build tooling, you have compilers, linters, uh, packagers, right? You have all these different things. And you also have machine identity, right? Where is that, where is that actually being built on? Is that being built on a server uh, in a basement somewhere in Russia, or is it being built on your hardened infrastructure and in, in your uh, AWS security group? Right, those are things that we really want to know about. Um, and then, you know, the outputs of that CI step, right, are of course, you know, your artifacts. Uh, it's, you're going to have your S bomb. You'll have different test results. You have some logs, and then and maybe you have some traces or syscalls so you can really understand, 
you know, what happened at the kernel level uh, during that CI step. So when you can take that CI step metadata, you push it to an external store, you make that available, right, to a metadata verifier or some sort of mission control, that allows you to have a really strong identity system um, over your software artifacts, right? And, and this is really what, what the NTIA is looking at with the SBOM, right? With that SBOM, we push that SBOM to an external store. Um, and we're able to get insight into exactly what is in that software artifact and make real-time decisions of whether we're going to allow that artifact to have access to uh, network resources and, and compute resources. Um, so, you know, we, we've been putting together, we've been doing some work on Intoto to actually make this happen. Uh, Intoto is a great open source uh, 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 piece of software. Uh, what it does is it allows you to uh, sign metadata from each of the build stages in your CI process and then compare those uh, pieces of metadata to a build policy that you create. And so that build policy then verifies that those steps actually took place as you expected them to. And you'll see a little bit more of this when we get to the demo. I'll make a little bit of sense. But the key part of this is that it really decouples verification from the build steps. In almost every single CI system that I've seen, right, that verification actually has, happens as part of the CI process, right? So you place, you, you're almost forced to place that trust in the software producer, right? Now, within Toto, in this pattern, uh, the software consumer is actually able to do that. Uh, the other uh, piece of software that we use was Spire. Um, Spire is uh, a, a system for distributing uh, uh, certificates across um, infrastructure. Uh, it's got a robust plugin system, right? So, you know, we, we actually wrote a plugin that ties into a hardware root of trust using a TPM 2.0. Uh, works, works absolutely great. Uh, really love the plugin API. They have a great community, and, you know, it's a standard based, um, uh, uh, it's standard based, which means. Uh, there's a governing body to it. So it's not just going to change whenever, right? Uh, they actually want multiple implementations of the Spiffy. Of Spiffy. Inspire is just a reference implementation. So when we take those two projects and we put them together, right, we have this automatic way that we can deliver certificates to our workloads uh, using Inspire. And then we also have Intoto, which takes the inputs and the outputs of uh of a build step and is a late, allows us to verify that that happened. That allows us to actually build an automated system that satisfies those goals that that MITRE had. Um, so I'm going to switch over to a demo here and kind of show you um, how, how everything works. So the first thing I want to do is kind of bring you through, uh, you know, what a layout is. Um, so. This is our build policy, right? And this is completely decoupled um, from our actual build steps, right? So what we do is we sign our layout uh, that validates that our build step happened as we are expected. And we do this with, with an offline key. Um, in this demo, we're, we're kind of faking it a little bit. And uh, we have our key just sitting in the repository. So you can see uh, right here, it's this owner key. Um, and I have a little script that actually signs that layout file, takes that unsigned layout, and then signs it, right? And, and then we verify that that signature is actually valid um, at, at the verification time. Um, so then let me go into the GitLab CI and kind of show you exactly how uh, we're wrapping uh, our commands within Toto. Um, so right here you see we have the Intoto command. Now this is, this Intoto is uh, from our fork. This is not the upstream Intoto. We're really working hard to get this upstream. There's a few changes that we need to make. Hopefully we'll, we'll have a PR in there by the time you all see this. Um, so we, we have Intoto, then we run, and then we're cloning, um, uh, where the name of the step is clone, and we're specifying some products, right? So the output of this um, is going to be a, a directory named go hello world, right? And that's expected. And then we have our Spiffy uh, workload API path. Uh, now, what we did is we exposed, we deployed Spiffy on the, the cluster that GitLab is running on. And then it uh, mounted this socket um, uh, into each one of the build containers. All right. 
and then we actually just have our command right there, right? So we're actually doing our clone command and then making sure that we're at the right SHA hash, right? And so the artifacts for this are gonna be something called a link metadata file, right? And this will contain all the information about what happened with the products that, or the materials that went into, into this and the products that came out. Uh, so, and then let's go down to the next one, right? So the next next command, right, we're uh, doing our intel to run again, and this is our build step, right? So our materials are gonna be everything that's in that, that directory. That's everything that came from that clone step. Um, and then our products, uh, right, we're building it, so it's gonna be a binary that comes out. And then what's cool here is we're actually uh, creating an SPDX, which is that SBOM that, that we talked about a little bit earlier in the talk. Um, so we have our spiffy workload path again. Um, and then we have our go, go build command. And then we're using this bomb tool uh, from the uh, Kubernetes uh, distribution. Uh, so there's a recent PR where, where Kubernetes is actually creating an SPDX uh, uh, SBOM. So I pulled that tool in, added it to uh, that base container and, and in generating that SBOM right there. So that should work. All right, so then let's look at the next line here. Um, so now we're building an image, right? Um, and we're creating a tar file, a Docker image. Um, and then we're doing a scan, we're using Trivi. Uh, we're using the latest uh, image there. And then uh, we have our, our script right here that, hey, downloads Trivi, gets everything ready to go. And that, hey, again, you see here, where our products are the Trivi scanning report and our materials are that go hello world.tar. So we're telling, now we tell Trivi, hey, go take that hello world.tar and create a scanning report in that JSON. So now we have all these different artifacts. So we see, we, we, we bring those out and those are gonna be available at the end. And then the last step, this is a verify step. Now, now in this pipeline, in this example, we actually have that verify right before we push it to our registry. Um, ideally, in a zero trust architecture, right, we, we wanna actually verify it before we give it access to network resources um, or compute resources, right? So this might be at admission uh, that we'd start running some of this stuff. And you know, that's some work that we still have to do there. Uh, but you can see we have uh, this in total verify. We give it that sign layout file that I was talking about, and then we give it the public key uh, for, that, for that layout. Um, you can also give it X509 certificates too. So, um, you know, really interesting. You could sign it with a smart card uh, if, you, if you're a DOD user or, or maybe a Yubi key. Um, and, and then you really have strong control over, over what goes into that system. Um, so you can see, and then we also connect to the uh, Spiffly workload API so we can grab that trust bundle, right? So then if, it, if that gives us a good exit status, then we uh, push it to our registry. So let's go ahead and kind of actually see what this looks like. Um, so this is a recorded talk, so kind of cheated a little bit. I know this is gonna work. Oh, if, uh, if my internet will get fast. All right, so let's go look at that one. Don't look at that failed one. We'll talk about that one in just one second. Um, so right, we have this clone step. And you'll see artifact, we have this link metadata file. All right, so now we have, so you can, oh, let me zoom in here. It might be a little bit tough for you to watch. So you can see in this link metadata file, we have the products, right? Hashes of everything in there. And then we have byproducts, right? What was our return value? What happened on the command line when all that happened? Uh, you know, and then it has our command. So everything here, and then we can see we actually have a signature and then we have our, our, our certificate here, right? This is some of the work that we did actually with the certificate constraint system to make that happen. All right, let's close that out. Um, and let's go into the next job. Uh, so we have, as you see, we have that link metadata. I want to actually open that up, but we also generated an SPDX file. Uh, so let's go ahead and download that and actually see what that looks like. All right. There we go. All right, so look at this. We have a compliant SPDX file, right? And then if we actually go and we look into that link metadata file, let's download this guy. Let's 
So you have all of our materials, so we know what went into that S-bomb. And then our products, right? There we go. We have our hash right there for our SPDX file. And we have our signature over this whole file. So we can actually validate that that's correct. Um, and we do that. So let's go back into our verification step. All right. Right, and we can see right here that, um, right, there we go, in total verify. And we have uh, some warnings, right? I think we can we can lock this down a little more if we want. Um, but, you know, all the files, all the inputs and all the outputs actually passed. Um, and we'll go actually take a look at this layout file one more time so I can show you actually what we're doing there. So we're doing a, actually a verify and we're doing an inspection. We're making sure that our Go Hello World uh, is, is, is made with products from the build image stage. Uh, we're matching the image ID, right? That's a hash of the image and we're making, making sure that's made with products from the build image. Same with the Trivi scanning report from the scan image and then that Go Hello World SPDX with products from build. So right here, we're actually doing cryptographic verification that everything that came out was from those materials that we put in that was from our Git repository. Uh, we can extend this even a step further, you know, and verify that all those commits were signed by developers if that's that's within our organizational policy. Um, and then we're checking here, right? So our cert constraints. This is the work that you know we really spent a lot of time at Boxboat was because traditionally in Toto it requires you know public key, private key pair, right? That doesn't really work with uh, uh, enterprise organizations or using short-lived keys. So we added a certificate constraint system that allows us to specify fields on that certificate uh, to see if that step was valid. So um, during this step, we used a container that we, we gave the identity of uh, Intoto Builder to. And we're making sure that, hey, yes, that container was the one that, that we expected to. So if a malicious actor replaced that container with something that they put in there that might have some of their, their malicious tooling in it, right? It would never be issued this identity and we would not pass this step. Um, so, you know, and let's go take a look what that looks like too. What happens if we do do something? Uh, so we can see we had a hacker come in here uh, and try to do an MR on our repository. So let's go look at the changes they did. Uh, look at this, right? So they, they did a said, uh, and our GitLab CI.yaml, right? What developer looks at their GitLab CI.yaml after uh, they already got it set up? Um, so, uh, right, a malicious actor could have could have put some sort of a Trojan horse in here, but because we're using Intoto, that verify actually failed. Go look at the logs for that. Right, inspection failed, error artifact verification failed for set build, materials main.go disallowed by rule of disallow. So right there, we, we caught the hacker. And now I think that's the end of the demo. So I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Nicole and she's, uh, she's gonna go over how this applies to GitLab. Thank you, Cole. So what does GitLab think about this? We love that Boxboat did this proof of concept, leveraging the open source tools in Toto and Spire to incorporate attestation documentation into a pipeline. It weaves through multiple GitLab stages, manage compliance, verify, package, release, and secure. They're showing off the power of all-in-one DevSecOps. We at GitLab have also had an increase in customer interest in software bill of materials, signed build documentation, and many more complex verifications within the build process. As Cole mentioned, we believe this mostly has to do with the executive order here in the States. However, there are many regulated industries who want these capabilities. GitLab is watching the Linux Foundation, Digital Bill of Materials, and other projects with the desire to integrate them into our pipelines. Now, here are some roadmap items. If his demo piqued your interest, you may want to keep an eye on these. Verify build artifacts, package release evidence, 
release compliance tooling, and secure composition analysis software bill of materials. And here are some of the relevant GitLab backlog issues. The best way to make sure that the relevant product manager is alerted is to upvote and comment with any additional context on why or how you would use the proposed feature in the issue so that they can be sure that what they've designed is really what it is that you want. You, of course, are not limited to just showing your interest on existing items in the GitLab backlog. You can propose new features if those don't cover your needs. If you're a developer, you could actually go ahead, take the proof of concept from the box boat blog and start incorporating that into different pieces of GitLab and move to get those relevant pieces into GitLab itself. Remember, everyone can contribute. Or if you would prefer, and you're a box boat customer, you should chat with your account team and let them know that this is something you would like to invest in maturing. Thank you for coming to listen to us talk about securing the software supply chain with SBOM and attestation. We look forward to your questions. Please enjoy the rest of Commit.